assuming no one has ever redirected the bus cliché to an alternate mode of transport before, I hereby stake a claim to be the first. You wait ages and ages for one movie featuring crime on an anachronistically elegant train, and then, a week after the numbing, joyless murder on the Orient Express, Paddington 2 steams into town as the perfect antidote. Long before a climactic chase scene involving a train barely less luxurious than Poirot's, a gooey grin was immovably plastered over my face. Experience teaches skepticism about the claims of publicity personnel. But when the young woman from Studio Kano wielding the clipboard at the door trailed it as the most joyous of movies, she spoke the plain truth, there is so much to love about the sequel to the surprise global smash of 2014 that it's hard to know where to start. So let's take the advice Julie Andrews gave the Von Trapp children, and start at the very beginning. Three years after arriving from Latin America and escaping Nicole Kidman's evil clutches, the red hat-clad marmalade chomper again voiced by Ben Wishaw with the ideal mix of tenderness, quizzicality and, when required, iron resolve is blissfully ensconced within the bosom of the Brown family, where he may sign charge, I do want his pituitary gland looked at, because he hasnt grown by so much as a millimeter. Yet sometimes, even with a gritty realistic docudrama about a bear who learned to speak Her Majesty's English in darkest Peru, you have to suspend disbelief. Besides, Paddington's lack of growth is no concern to the Brown household, midlife crisis father Henry Hugh Bonneville, sweet and funny illustrator mother Mary Sally Hawkins, teen children Judy and Jonathan Madeline Harris and Samuel Joslin and Miss Travis Scottish housekeeper Mrs. Bird, Julie Walters. Thor Ragnarok Review, The God of Thunder hammers home the jokes Paddington's charm, decency and exquisite manners have made him an almost universally beloved figure in a Notting Hill of deliberately unclear vintage, though it feels mostly like the late 50s when Michael Bond published his first book. The Calypso playing street musicians are back, rhythmically hinting at the era when the first migrants arrived from the Caribbean. I say almost universally because Peter Capaldi's bossily xenophobic Mr. Curry, a hybrid of it Nigel Farage and Inspector Blake from On the Buses, is still out for Paddington, who now has a deadlier enemy neighbor than him. The Oscars judges, in their fearsome pomposity, tend to overlook acting in films such as this, but Hugh Grant deserves a nomination for his work here. You will seldom see a more glorious comic turn than Grant, as Phoenix Buchanan, a one-time theatrical legend if only in his own dressing room reduced to dressing up as a spaniel to advertise dog food on TV. The wickedly underrated Grant pastiche as the has-been ham with the beguiling confidence of one who knows that his own career is moving in the opposite direction to his characters. Having more than held his own against Meryl Streep in Florence Foster Jenkins, he is utterly spectacular here as one of those florid, fruity, cravat-wearing old gits you imagine propping up the Garrick bar, telling ancient apocryphal tales about Johnny, Ralph and Dear, Dear Larry, the scenes in which Phoenix interacts with his old costumes to reprise his greatest hits, in sly homage to Vincent Price's high camp gothic masterclass in Theatre of Blood, are hilarious. Paddington 2 trailer While too many other fine British actors to be listed have cameos, Grant's only rival is a great Irish actor. Brendan Gleeson sparkles by playing it. Fairly straight as Knuckles McGinty, the terrifying inmate cook whose heart Paddington melts in him portobello, with the sweetness first of his orange marmalade and then of himself. Those muscular tabloids that enjoy moaning about the effeteness of the penal system will be refreshed to find Paddington sent down for a ten stretch for minor theft. Technically, Tom Conti judge should have recused himself. Pre-trial, the bear had accidentally shaved half his head while working in a barber's to earn enough for the London Landmarks pop-up book he wants to send to his great-aunt Lucy back in Peru voiced by Imelda Staunton for her 100th birthday. It is for stealing that from the antiquarian shop of Mr. Gruber Jim Broadbent that Paddington is falsely convicted in the most egregious miscarriage of justice since the Dreyfus Affair. Thanks to a Shawshankian turn of events, he is liberated to wage a desperate battle for survival with Buchanan, who wants the book for a less noble reason. The film's optimistic messages about embracing otherness rather than fearing it, and the power of goodness and courtesy to overwhelm shouty aggression, seem oddly relevant at this moment in national life. Although an underwater rescue scene is more James Bond than Michael, the film's spirit is thoroughly loyal to the author, who died this year aged 91. Returning as director and co-writer with Simon Farnaby of an outstanding script, Paul King melds a plethora of laugh-aloud gags, visual and verbal, with a coherent story that is touching without straying into sentimentality. If Richard Curtis had shown the same rigor in excising the mawkishness from his utopian vision of Notting Hill, Grant might have had an Oscar nomination for that movie. This one, which ends perfectly with Grant sampling the producers, belongs to him more even than to Paddington. On this form he won't be flogging dog food on the telly for a while yet.